Well, we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks for all, all of you for uh, joining us this afternoon. Uh, my name is Scott Hodge. I'm president of the Tax Foundation. And uh, I'd like to uh, welcome all of you uh, to our second Talking Tax Reform Forum. Uh, the first one that we had a few weeks ago was on uh, the destination-based cash flow tax and the border adjustability. And today we're talking about a rather uh, different sort of topic when it comes to tax reform and one that doesn't really come to mind to a lot of people, and that's uh, how federal tax reform affects the states. And um, we're very pleased to be coming, for those of you who are watching online and, and from your homes and offices, uh, we're coming to you live from the U.S. Capitol. We're down the hall. Uh, members are uh, debating, or at least preparing to debate and vote uh, on health care reform. So it's a rather uh, busy day here at the Capitol. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of uh, news being made and other issues. Um, but uh, we're going to take a break from all of that and talk about tax reform and the impact on the states. You know, a lot of people think of tax reform, they're thinking about, well, how is it going to affect my pocketbook? How is it going to affect my business? Uh, and a lot of people, the last thing they think about is, how is it going to affect my state? But we have uh, 7,400 legislators out there and 32,000 staff that we've all invited to join with us live today uh, through our streaming service. And we think that they have a pretty keen interest in what and how um, tax reform will affect them. Um, it's rather interesting that we're here in this room with a portrait of Dick Armey, former uh, uh, majority leader here in the House of Representatives for many years. I had the opportunity to follow him around for a while while he was doing town hall meetings uh, advocating the flat tax. And Army would get a lot of questions about the flat Yeah, you know, Dick, I, I kind of like that flat tax. I like the simplicity of it. I like the fact that it's got a simple rate. But gee, I, I'm not sure I want to give up my mortgage interest deduction. I'm not sure I want to give up my charitable deduction. And you know, he said, you know, I, I know. But you know, I, I want to go to heaven, but I don't want to die. <laughs> Sometimes in order to get what we want, we have to give up a little something. And that's the lesson of tax reform. And we're going to explore that a little bit today. And for those of you who are watching and, and pretty adept at Twitter, uh, unlike me, uh, you can always uh, uh, send us or tweet us uh, your comments, questions, or just do a play-by-play -play of today's event uh, at hashtag talking tax. You know, there are a lot of anxieties about tax reform in the states. How do these changes impact the states? Uh, we know that federal, state, and uh, and often local uh, tax systems are linked to the federal tax code. Might some of these changes pull the rug out from under states, uh, you know, affect their finances in some way? On the other hand, perhaps it could be a windfall for states with the right kind of federal tax reform. Uh, some other states may decide to decouple. How should they go about uh, maintaining their link with this federal system? especially if we have truly transformational tax reform as the kind that's being discussed by the House uh, of Representatives with the, uh, uh, the, what they call the GOP blueprint, which does have some rather dramatic changes to the tax system that we'll talk about. And then uh, the real question, or maybe we can look back and see, well, how have states approached tax re federal tax reform in the past? We have had big tax changes over the decades. Uh, certainly the 1982 tax reform. Uh, we had uh, other changes in uh, 1986 that were rather dramatic. And we had more recent changes in the uh, 2000s and even more recently. So all of these things are very instructive and give us some insights into how states will not only be impacted, but how they're going to respond. And we're going to explore all of those. We've got an all-star cast. If you follow state and, and uh, local tax policy, I think you'd be pretty impressed by the experts that we have here today. And uh, the first is my colleague, Nicole Cady, who is an economist at the Tax Foundation's state policy team, uh, who has just released a study on the topic. I have to happen to have it here. Federal tax reform in the states, the impact on the states. And uh, you can get it uh, on our website at taxfoundation.org. 
A lot of people say, wait a minute, you're the Federal Tax uh, Foundation. You actually have a state team? And, and uh, in fact, we do. In fact, what a lot of people don't realize is that we've been following uh, and, and uh, working at the state level since our founding in 1937. In fact, during the World War II, the Tax Foundation had teams of people uh, that would barnstorm across the states, helping state and local governments set up what they called tax expenditure councils. They wanted to be, have watchdogs right there at the state and local level because, as they used to say, a dollar of government waste was a dollar that couldn't go to the war effort. Well, we still have a team of tax experts barnstorming the states, and now we're working to help states uh, reform their tax systems, make their tax systems uh, uh, more competitive, more pro-growth, and more taxpayer friendly. And uh, Nicole is one of our stars on our tax team. And joining uh, us today is Max Belke from the National Conference of State Legislators. Uh, Max is well known to legislators out there who are watching in today. He's the Director of Budget and Tax at the NCSL Washington uh, DC office. In his role, he coordinates the conference's advocacy before Congress and the administration on areas of budgeting, taxation, unfunded mandates, and fiscal federalism. He also serves as the director of NCSL's Executive Committee uh, tax for, task, not tax, task Force on State and Local Taxation, which meets uh, regularly to discuss these issues. And finally, but not least, is our friend Matt Gardner, from the Institute on uh, Taxation and Economic Policy, or ITEP. Uh, Matt is well known in state circles. He's the senior fellow there at uh, ITEP. And his work focuses on state and local tax systems and their effect on low and middle income taxpayers. He's well known as the author of ITEP's biannual report, Who Pays? A Distributional Analysis of Tax Systems at the All 50 States and he's offered numerous other uh, comparative studies on specific take state tax systems. So without further ado, we'll start out with Nicole Cady to give us an overview uh, of her recent research. Nicole. Thank you, Scott, for that introduction, and welcome to all of you here in the room as well as on the live stream. I'll be going over a few different topics to set the stage for our conversation today. Um, we'll first talk about the House GOP blueprint. Use that as our basis of conversation we're talking about federal tax reform. Um, I should also note the Trump administration has a tax plan as well, but we'll, for time, limit our comments to the GOP blueprint for this conversation. We'll talk about this idea of conformity, which is the way that federal and state income tax codes are interconnected. We'll talk about what impacts federal tax reform would have on revenue in the states, and we'll talk about then also ways that states could mitigate any revenue changes that they would see from the GOP blueprint. Um, so first, to discuss what the GOP blueprint is. This was released uh, last summer by the House Conference. On the individual side, it includes a number of changes. It takes the current seven uh, bracket individual income tax structure with rates from 10 to 39.6% and consolidates that into three brackets of 12, 25, and 33. The current federal standard deduction would be expanded from 6,300 to 12,600 for individuals, goes from 12 to 24,000 for married filers. It would eliminate all itemized deductions except for two, the mortgage interest deduction and the deduction for charitable gifts. It would, including in that, would eliminate the deduction for state and local taxes paid. That's 78% of those itemized deductions that were, would be eliminated under the blueprint is that one deduction for state and local taxes paid. And I'm sure we'll have lots of conversation about that deduction. Um, it also eliminates the federal estate tax. On the corporate side, it moves the current corporate income tax at the federal level to what's been called a destination-based cash flow tax. That tax, in essence, involves three major components. First, it would be a change to what's called full expensing. Uh, corporations would be allowed to um, write off the cost of all capital, capital expenditures at the time that they are made, not over depreciation schedule. It would remove the deduction for net interest paid by corporations. And three, it would include what's, called, what's been called the border adjustment tax, or it's the border adjustment. Um, this would, in essence, um, disallow the deduction for imported cost of goods sold, but would exempt uh, exported cost from a firm's corporate liability. 
If we look at all of those various components, there's of course a lot going on there. Um, we think it's important using our taxes and growth model at the Tax Foundation to estimate the impact on the economy of these changes. Uh, we did just that. We find, one, that this plan in total would reduce federal revenues by $2.4 trillion over the 10-year federal budget window, which is about a 6% decrease in federal revenues. We would increase long-run GDP by just over 9%. We would increase wages by just under 8%, and we would increase full-time equivalents in the, the country, the number of employees, by almost 2 million individuals. So a very pro-growth tax reform plan. But what does that mean? So we can talk about the impact of the federal reform, but what we need to think about is how are states impacted by federal tax reform? The key to understanding this relationship is this term called conformity. Federal tax reform tax codes impact state tax codes. In most states, if you were to pull up a state's tax code and you start reading the statute, you will again and again see references to the Internal Revenue Code. It will say refer to this section of the Internal Revenue Code when we're defining a term. For instance, I was looking at one state's estate tax code just this week and was looking at the definition of what is a qualified heir. It literally said refer to this section of the IRC if you want to know what a qualified heir is in that state. States do this for two reasons. The first is that it makes it administratively simple for the filer. The filer is able to take their tax return that they've now completed for the federal government and they then copy a number from one specific line and that goes on their state return. Now states might make some changes to it, but that number gets copied over. It saves the filer from having to duplicate a great deal of efforts. The second is also for administrative simplicity for the state itself. They don't have to define in state statute what is a qualified heir. They can just say, use the federal government's definition. That also allows them to rely on the IRS for things like audits. They can rely on the results of an IRS audit for their state. They can rely on federal private letter rulings as well. They can use federal guidance that's issued. So there's a lot of benefits to the states for conforming. Now, that's not to say that federal, the federal tax code is perfect. We all know that it's not. Um, and even under the GOP blueprint, it would likely not be a perfect federal tax code. But the advantages and simplicity are why states tend to conform. So how do they conform? Um, states particularly conform in one of two ways, what's called static conformity, which would be you conform as of a specific date, say January 1, 2016. The other is that you have what's called rolling conformity, that every time the IRC changes, that change immediately feeds through into your state's tax code. The states are about split. 20 states have rolling conformity, 18 states, states have static conformity, and then those that have static conformity, there's a a uh, large variation. Most states are conformed as of 2015 or 2016. Massachusetts hasn't conformed since 2005. Um, so there's a large gap in terms of what that conformity means. If we think about the individual level and how do states conform, we have nine states that don't tax individual income in any notable way, seven states that have no individual income tax, two that only tax uh, interest and dividend uh, income. But then the 36 states you conform to the federal government either using federal gross income, federal adjusted gross income, or federal taxable income. Meaning that if you're a taxpayer in a state that conforms to federal AGI, you take federal AGI and you simply start your state return with that number. And then the remaining states have their own calculation. Again, there can be adjustments, so some states might further limit a deduction or a federal ex tax expenditure. They might expand it. So for instance, um, some states on Social Security income will have a broader state um, exclusion on Social Security income than the federal government does. Um, we also have states that will allow for a deduction of federal taxes paid from their state return. So, but in essence, 36 states are using federal definitions of income as their state income. On the corporate side, it's even broader. 41 states use federal taxable income either before or after net operating losses as their basis of the state return. Uh, again, working in that same sort of structure that the corporations are taking their taxable income from the federal return, using that to begin their state return. So what does this mean? Why do we, how, how does federal tax reform actually impact the states? Well, if we think back to how I described the blueprint, 
what we really see as a much, much broader base of federal income. We've eliminated all itemized deductions except for two. The federal base is now much bigger. But as you notice, as I talked about how states can form, what I didn't talk about, though, was rates. And this is where the states and the federal government diverge. States use the federal base, but they set their rates independently. So as the federal base becomes broader under the GOP blueprint, the state bases will now become broader. Um, that means that their revenue will increase because their bases are now much broader than they otherwise would. Um, to give a sense of this, we don't have exact numbers on how much this would be for each state, um, but there was some research done last year that estimated the impact on state revenues if you eliminated all federal deductions and expenditures. So this, of course, is a too big of a number. This is going to set, um, but it gives us a context here. Uh, that research said the average state would see an increase in individual income tax revenue of just under 35%. These are fairly large increases in revenue that we're talking about for the individual side. On the corporate side, it's a bit harder to know um, for a few reasons. Um, one, we know that full expensing would be a loss of revenue for states. It's a loss of revenue for the federal government, and it's a very front-loaded cost. We're talking about costs in the first couple years, while on the federal level, they, they get very close to zero net at the end of the 10-year window. We know the net interest deduction would be a revenue increase for states, but that's actually probably a backloaded revenue increase because of the way that would be phased in. The border adjustment, though, is it's hard to know. Um, one, we don't actually have good data on imports and exports by state. Um, the Census Bureau has some data. Um, but they even suggest that it's probably not based on consumption, but perhaps is tracking goods and services based on distribution centers or intermediate, intermediate points of, of sale. Um, so we don't have good data there. There's also very large questions on the, the way the border adjustment would work in terms of if it's instituted uh, as a credit or a deduction. Again, if we think back to this way that conformity works, um, if it's a deduction, that likely would just flow through to the states because of their conforming to definitions of income. But if you're providing a credit, that likely would be something that states would have to decide whether or not to conform to that. The timing is also a big concern that states are, are working through. The federal government has a bit of flexibility. One, the federal government has the ability to run deficits in any year. The federal government also operates over a 10-year budget window. So we think about things in Washington over what's the 10-year score in relation to the baseline. States do not have that flexibility. 49 of the 50 states have balanced budget requirements, though they sometimes play games with those sorts of restrictions. Uh, but all states budget on a one or a two-year time frame. So this presents a challenge for states particularly on something like a full expensing, which is a front-loaded cost in years one and two, perhaps years three, et cetera. They need to reconcile that revenue in that first year or that second year in their budget. Um, we also will have some concerns from states of things like eliminating the, state, the deduction for state and local taxes paid. Um, that deduction in particular benefits high-income taxpayers in um, wealthier states. So we think about California and New York get almost 30% of the benefit of this deduction. Um, the deduction is worth almost is just over 9% of AGI in the state of New York. Um, so New York, California, DC, Connecticut, these, these sorts of places care a great deal about this deduction. Um, and I'm sure they will have lots to say about the elimination of that. The other thing that I thought was interesting is we went back and looked at what states did in 80, after 86. 86 was the last time the federal government did uh, a comprehensive tax reform. We find a few things. Just like um, under the current structure, states saw an increase of revenue. According to the National Association of State Budget Officers, the average state saw an increase in revenue of about 9%. Um, most states ended up copying some sort of version of the federal reform. They lowered their rates and they brought in their basis. Now, each state behaved a bit differently. Minnesota decided to do comprehensive tax reform and in essence rewrote their entire tax code um, in relation to the federal changes. Um, the state of Ohio decided to lower its rates so that every dollar of new revenue went back to taxpayers. My home state of Indiana decided to keep a little bit of extra revenue as part of that, though they did make some other base changes as well. But in general, all 50 states moved in the direction that the feds did. 
But again, this idea of revenue is important. If we look at, however, uh, in 2002, Congress passed accelerated depreciation at the federal level. That's a revenue decrease for the feds, just like it is for the states. States, particularly in a recession, a lot of their spending is countercyclical. They felt a, a large strain. 30 states uh, decoupled from that provision within one year uh, because of that, that revenue loss. And then finally, I'll, I'll mention quickly, um, there are options for states, however, as they work through this process. Uh, there are a number of different ways that they can mitigate any revenue impacts that they see. The largest one is phasing in reforms. As I said at the very beginning, the federal code is not perfect, nor will it be perfect, but conformity is the end goal. It is simpler for the state and for the filer to have that conformity. So perhaps the state will look at phasing in these reforms. Of course, we don't have legislative language at the federal level either, and there likely will need to be some sort of transition period as well. So states perhaps can use that transition to move. Um, we can look at things like revenue triggers, which are very popular at the state level. You condition a tax change on, a re on revenue being there. So you would say we would make a change from, say, 7% to 6% if we had an extra $300 million in revenue. So you can make it conditional. You can do things like contingent enactment clauses. One of the struggles that states are going to have is that states uh, budget on a July 1 fiscal year. Uh, most states do. Um, likely federal tax reform is not going to happen until the end of this calendar year, perhaps beginning of next calendar year. They're going to be a bit off cycle of each other, but they could easily write in their budgets this year if federal term tax reform happens, we will do X, or more likely, we will call a special session in this time uh, and place so that we can deal with these complex issues. And then finally, um, particularly for states that are looking um, to close any revenue gaps or to make these things work at the end of the day, of course, the option of concurrent reform is always on the table. Um, and we're happy to work with states throughout that process, uh, identifying ways that you could perhaps move in the direction of federal reform, lowering your rates, broadening your bases at the state level um, to mirroring those pro-growth effects at the federal level. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to my panelists, and I look forward to the Q&A. Thank you very much. And uh, <laughs> we will turn it over to uh, Max to... Uh, Give me my Start thoughts. The well, thank you, Scott. First, I'd like to say thanks, Scott and Nicole and the Tax Foundation team for having us here today. Uh, it's great that there is a focus on state and local taxes because uh, often state and local government is overlooked by Washington. Uh, and so it's good. I'm really glad to be here today. Uh, and with uh, the, political, the healthcare law and political life support, it's glad that we're talking about something a lot less controversial, um, <laughs> overhauling the federal tax code. Uh, the, uh, I did bring this, I did find a copy of here today, a little light reading. This is the original 1913 tax code. And if you will um, notice, Nicole, in here is the state and local tax deduction. So it, it's been around uh, yes. ever since the beginning. Um, so if we want to go back to simplicity, I'm all for it. Let's just make sure we go back and keep the things that were in here. Um, <laughs> so uh, the, the big thing that I want to stress today is that states can't be an afterthought. Uh, that what goes on on the state level or what, you know, states have to balance their budgets. One thing Congress is really good at, and they're not good at a lot of things, but they're really good at adding deficits because of, you know, it's a lot easier to borrow money than it is to have a politically difficult decision to make. I don't, you know, I don't want to raise taxes or cut a program, so we'll just borrow for future generations. States don't have that luxury. Uh, this year, they, uh, you had 30 states that had budget deficits, and they had to deal with them. And when they see what's going on in Washington, that you know, possibility their health care funding could be cut, or that, you, that th these calls could be shifted down to the state level, that they're not going to come through in a transportation package. Well, states have to pave the roads. They have to provide these services. They have to provide education. Uh, they, you know, they have to do these things, uh, un unlike Congress, which just keeps you know, not doing a whole lot of much of anything. Uh, so during the, um, the, this year, the, the number one call I've been getting in our office has been, especially the beginning part of the year, was what, you know, states have short sessions, they have longer sessions, a lot have already adjourned, and they're near, near, nearing completing their, their budgets. And um, I understand the, the, Nicole, as you said, you can plan for it now, but it's really hard to plan for the tax code or changes if you don't know if they're going to happen or what they're going to be. It's, it's very difficult to actually put that into text. I mean, we don't even know if this border adjustability tax, how that would impact states. Uh, I mean, it's politically controversial enough, so I, I'm not sure I would go ahead and put that provision in because I, I don't think it's, I think it's DOA and especially in the Senate. Uh, but they, they've been calling and go, what's going to happen up here? What's going to happen with my budget? And I'm not a really good staffer because I go, I don't know. Um, 
maybe call back next week. And then, you know, I don't really have many answers to that. Uh, but, you know, as, as they try to navigate these things, and I think at some point they got to a level where we have to work with our budget, and whatever happens, happens, and we'll go back in a special session if we need to. Uh, so, the, I do believe that this, what this health care reform debate has shown here is how difficult adjusting some of these, uh, uh, you know, these big topics out there is going to be, especially in the tax code. Taxes are inherently political. People don't like to pay taxes, but yet the government needs to be funded. Uh, they like their deductions. There's a reason that it's in there, because someone spent a lot of money putting it in the tax code, and they're going to put a lot of money out there to keep it there. Uh, let's, you know, it, it, I think tax code you know, generally is bipartisan support for tax reform, and everybody goes, great, let's broaden the base, lower the rate. Let's get rid of deductions, except for mine. Um, and that's, and then everybody in the room is saying that. And it's like, oh, well, let's get rid of that one, but we need to keep mine. But I'm here to say the state and local tax deduction is the one that needs to be kept. Uh, uh, it, just because it has been around for so long that states have actually built their tax codes around it. And with all these other changes they're gonna have to deal with for whatever else could happen, to actually take away one of the main deductions that's been around since the, their inception of, the, of their tax codes, um, I don't think it would be another, it would be another um, burden put off on the states to, to actually have to figure out how to comply with that. Uh, finally, I, I guess before, I'll keep my comments brief so we can uh, have, and turn it over to Matt for his discussion. Uh, brief comments, I guess. Uh, but the, the 80s were different when we did tax reform then. The tax code was a lot different. The rates were a lot higher. There were a lot more deductions. That's not quite the, the case now. Um, so the political environment is a lot different for lots of reasons. Uh, it was a bipartisan chamber then. Revenue neutrality was especially important. Um, I'm not sure that, you know, where we're going to see that here. Um, and I also wonder as well is that what's going on, I do think that the administration and Congress isn't going to need a win. Is tax reform going to be that win? And if they can't get through a reform, are we eventually going to go to a point where we just seek tax cuts? Because they're politically easier to, to pass, and yet it would count off as a victory for um, some parties. So this, the taxes are inherently political, and this, this, this whole overall reform is going to be a very political uh, discussion. Um, but I think we're going to see what happens this afternoon with the health care vote and what that kind of sets the stage for for the remainder of this Congress for any issue, especially big issue like tax reform. Thank you very much, uh, Max. And we'll now turn it over to Matt. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, it feels like a good day and an appropriate day to be having this conversation uh, because people in this room care a lot about the federal state tax linkage, and people outside this room don't care at all. <laughs> uh, more so than is usually the case, most minds are elsewhere. And I think all too often that is the case with this important, uh, important linkage. So I'm appreciative to. Uh, Scott and the Tax Foundation for, uh, for having this venue to talk about this. Uh, Nicole's overview of the, uh, of the parameters here is as systematic and as complete as we'd expect from the uh, Tax Foundation. It's, it's good stuff and uh, can't really add anything to that. So I want to highlight a couple of topics that I think in, in a non-bomb throwing way ought, ought to help get some conversation started. and. Uh, First, uh, I want to emphasize that, uh, yeah, and this is going to echo a little bit of what Max has said, I think uh, pretty clearly there are going to be some major effects uh, on state revenues from federal tax reform if it's passed anything uh, resembling uh, what uh, the House GOP plan looks like right now. And a lot of those impacts could be positive. There's going to be wide variance. There's a lot of uncertainty about the impact of the border tax. but. You know, given the constrained fiscal environment in which states have to deal with their budget in every year, uh, any uncertainty, any change, positive or negative, is a threat, is, is a difficulty to states in budgeting. And I think it's vital that policymakers, as they think about these decisions, try to think a little bit about the impact uh, their proposals are having on the states. And in particular, I think it would be ideal if, as policymakers think about the objectives they're trying to achieve through federal tax reform, that they ask whether those objectives could be accomplished in a way that is less disruptive of the state budgeting process. We know that there is some precedent for that. We know that there's plenty of precedent for the opposite, where the Fed simply steamroll and do what they want and, and, and don't think so much about how states are going to be left to pick up the pieces. Uh, it would be, you know, I, I know right now there are 
people waiting anxiously for the next CBO score. All week long, there have been people uh, looking very attentively to see whether the decimals are going to move one bit as uh, each amendment to the ACA repeal legislation comes down. It would be pretty fantastic if when Joint Committee on Taxation and CBO score these things, if there were at least a line item in there trying to assess the net effect on state revenues. That might seem like it's asking a lot, but it's certainly not something that's beyond their capabilities. And I think would provide a pretty good reminder, a good poke in the ribs to Congress that they do need to factor these things in and ought to be thinking regularly ahead of time about these impacts. Uh, a second point, um, while it's vital to think about these direct linkages uh, that are outlined in the Tax Foundation paper between federal tax changes and state tax uh, structures, uh, that's only half of the vital uh, linkage in the budgeting process between federal and state governments. The other half, of course, is on the spending side. And all indicators are that the impacts on state governments from whatever form of a budget passes this year, assuming one eventually passes, <laughs> is likely going to be a lot bigger on the spending side and a lot more harmful on the spending side to states than anything uh, positive you might see on, on, on the tax side directly. And so I think it's pretty vital as states evaluate strategies along the lines of what uh, Nicole's paper outlines, that they maybe take a minute to wait for the dust to settle and try to get a sense, at least a modest sense, of what this offset and impact is. Uh, there is a long and sensible tradition of federal fiscal aid to states to achieve a number of important objectives. Uh, and while the situation states are in right now, uh, with, with areas as healthcare and education, uh, cer certainly doesn't mirror the situation facing, say, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Uh, it's, an, it's the same sort of existential issue in a lot of areas. Uh, there are real questions for fiscal 18, fiscal 19, about whether the revenue streams that states have come to depend on to help them fund basic services are going to be there. Uh, a third point. I think that is uh, worth highlighting is that without even thinking about, and you've already alluded to this a little bit, Max, uh, without even thinking about how much deeper the feds are going to dig the hole for states, many states are facing some pretty challenging circumstances right now. Something like 30 states face shortfalls coming into this fiscal year. There are half a dozen especially oil intensive states that are facing downgrades right now uh, because of the difficulties they've had in coming to grips with the pressure that oil prices have put on, on their revenues. So, you know, even if Congress wasn't there with a shovel digging the hole deeper, uh, a lot of states would be facing some pretty tumultuous policy battles over the next couple of years just seeking to make ends meet. Moreover, I think there are already a number of ways in which federal actions and more often inactions are making life harder for states, ranging from uh, the Marketplace Fairness Act to the continued battle over a quill to any number of other areas. And it's probably best for policymakers at the state level to think organically about all the pressures, positive and negative, that congressional action and inaction is putting on states, rather than thinking about this change uh, in its own. A couple more quick points. Uh, one, and this will seem more Pollyanna-ish, I guess, than everything I've said so far, uh, is that, uh, as Nicole alluded to, states do have some more practice now than they used to in dealing with this conformity issue. You can look at the bonus depreciation actions in 2002 and see that when states really want to decouple from something, they know how to do it. Uh, you can look at the uh, estate tax repeal and, and, and see even there that uh, a number of states found different ways to react to it. And of course, uh, back in 2001, when uh, the, the last time rates were dramatically lowered uh, as a result of the Bush tax cuts, you know, there were a couple of states before 2001 that actually based their income taxes as a, as a flat percentage of federal rules. And they pretty quickly found ways to decouple from that when they thought, uh, in their judgment, that the revenue loss uh, from the Bush tax cuts was going to be unaffordable for them. So there are plenty of good reasons to think that states are going to be able to 
you know, within the, 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 the constraints they face, balanced budget requirements almost un unanimously, uh, very short uh, legislative sessions, some of which are already done, um, that they're going to be able to at least come to grips with these things. And a last point contradicting the previous point, uh, the fallout from this federal tax, uh, the federal tax plans we're seeing right now may be entirely different and the pass-through effects may be entirely different and as you've pointed out, impossible to judge. We don't yet know what the impact of border, border adjustment, if it happens, is going to be. Um, so the challenges in coping with this are going to be a lot greater uh, for the states than maybe they were with something more straightforward like bonus depreciation. Um, lastly, I would just say that uh, there's an important principle that we need to maintain in thinking about this linkage. Uh, there's a long established principle that our national government exists to safeguard basic rights. Many of these are constitutional rights, federal constitutional rights. Many of them are not. There's no federal constitutional uh, uh, principle that says we need to have a good education system wherever you go. That's left to the states. But we do value having a basic quality of health care and education in all 50 states. And we know that left on their own, many states will not be able to provide a level of care, a level of education that most of us would recognize as adequate. And it's vital that whatever happens uh, with federal tax reform, that it does not damage states' ability to provide these, uh, these services on their own. And I'll leave it there. Well, and thank you very much, Matt, and, uh, and to all of you. Uh, and I, just a reminder for those of you who are on uh, Twitter, uh, send us your comments, questions, and, um, uh, and other thoughts at hashtag talking tax. And I'll uh, take the moderator's prerogative and ask the first question. I want to dive right into the politics. Uh, why not? We're here at the U.S. Capitol. Um, the state and local tax deduction, obviously, uh, is perhaps the, the biggest impact on the states, and it's going to affect states differently. And as you mentioned, Nicole, uh, what, California and New York <laughs> comprise a third of it. Um, but <laughs> can we talk about some of the, what are some of the other um, uh, uh, policy changes that might affect the states differently, uh, either regionally uh, or from a blue state, red state perspective, and where you might see some states that might be uh, more impacted than others. You might find some states that might see tax reform as a big win for them, while others might see it as, as, a, as, as a loss. Um, maybe we can just jump in and, and kind of tease out some of those specifics. Um, so one thing that jumps to mind uh, immediately is so we talk about on the individual side that for most states, as the blueprint is currently structured, you would see an increase in revenue on the individual income tax side. Um, but there are nine states that really don't have income taxes. Oh, yeah, um, right. And so we think about there are seven states that don't tax individual income at all, two that only tax interest and dividends. And those tend to be what we think of as red states, so states like Texas and Florida. Um, those states, uh, so I actually have a representative from South Dakota here, so I can't not mention that. Um, <laughs> So there's going to be, I think, some tension there. So those are states that are going to be much more attuned, particularly to the corporate income tax changes, things like the border adjustment, um, because they don't have the individual um, side revenue increases to help offset that. Very interesting. Matt or Max, any thoughts on that? Uh, in, in part, uh, yeah, I mean, the red state, blue state thing is clearly most pronounced on the uh, state and local tax deduction. It's, it's hard to hard to get away from that, and you can raise interesting questions about whether that objective could be done in a different way. I think uh, another interesting uh, divergence between the states is going to have to do with how they've react, especially on the corporate side, how they've reacted to uh, prior corporate tax changes. You know, if you've decoupled from bonus depreciation already, then the impact of moving to expensing or, or, not, or not doing so is, is going to be proportionally bigger for states. Um, that's, that's going to be a pretty big deal either way. Uh, there are interesting unanswered questions about some of the international uh, uh, proposals, in particular the, the one-time, uh, I guess it's a one-time tax on offshore profits, mm -hmm. that it's virtually impossible for anyone except, uh, I think a couple of states probably have a good idea that they're going to get dinged by that, but, but it's, it's pretty hard to know how that's going to shake out as well. But yeah, the, uh, the most striking thing about it is certainly the, uh, the fact that there are a few states, California, New York, uh, D.C., where 
the impact of losing the state and local income tax deduction could be pretty huge. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, there is the, I mean, red, blue state I, I, as well. I mean, you have two states, California and New York, that, that went one opposite of where the, the current party in control. But right now it's kind of hard for a state not to be red. Uh, 70 percent of the state legislatures are controlled by Republicans. So, uh, I mean, this will be impacted across the country to different states. They're all going to take some kind of hit or a gain, depending on what, what comes out uh, of, of this. Uh, and I mean, going back to the taxpayers themselves, I think, Nicole, you made a really important point when you opened up here is that transition rules are vital to whatever happens on the on the local, so regardless of what actually were to go to happen. I expect the bigger the change is, the more that states have to have time to figure it out. If you're a taxpayer and then have to you fill out whatever this new border adjustability tax is federally, and then you have to go fill out last year's tax code so that you can then use it as a baseline for your state return, um, you're going to make an awful lot of taxpayers upset, as well as for tax administrators. I was talking to a few tax administrators recently about this about where they are, and just from a pure administrative perspective, regardless of policy, they're going, we need, we need clarity, and mm -hmm. we need the ability at time to actually, you know, not every state's in every year. Uh, coming back in for special session is costly. Uh, you know, these conforming rules, it takes time to actually figure out where in the code it is, what are we going to do on the politics side of it, and then to actually implement those changes. So I just think that's an important point as we go and talk about this, that, the, you know, the politics are going to keep going back and forth in a lot of different parties and, you know, just as states have diverging views, so do other interests here in Washington. Not everybody agrees on everything nowadays here. Um, so, <laughs> the, um, you know, so I think that's, uh, you know, that those different competing perspectives are going to be out there as well. Um, but I think we're going to have to wait till we get our blueprint out there before we can really delve into how it's going to impact each state. Great. And uh, obviously we'd love to take uh, questions from those of you in the room. We do have one question uh, online. So Jimmy Gatliff on the uh, internet asks uh, to Nicole and, and the rest of the panelists, what are the effects of broadening the base and eliminating brackets on low and high income individual taxpayers, so both low and high income individual taxpayers? So the first part is it depends exactly how you do that. Um, if you are um, lowering the rates and, and broadening the bases, it likely how you broaden the base is going to have some impact, particularly on the distributional side of the equation. Um, but in general, if we think about, particularly on itemized deductions, if we're talking about eliminating itemized deductions, itemized deductions tend to be um, claimed by those at the upper ends of the income scale. Um, low income or middle income folks tend to take more of the standard deduction. Um, under the GOP blueprint, um, again, we're talking about doubling the standard deduction for individuals as well as for married filers. Um, I think there'll be a number of people who will switch even then from itemized deductions to the standard deduction um, on these sorts of changes. Um, the states, of course, then have similar things. So a number of states, uh, I think the number is 12, um, actually conform to the federal standard deduction. So their standard deduction is either because they, it's included either because it's specifically linked or because they use taxable income as their definition of income. So you're in essence capturing that. Um, you've got a number of states that also um, conform to the personal exemption at the federal level. Um, so that also can play a role, particularly um, how that's changed. The DFP blueprint, in essence, eliminates the personal exemption because they've expanded the standard deduction so, so much. Um, but then again, if we think about the state local tax deduction, we keep coming back to this. So if under the blueprint, it's 78% of all deductions that are eliminated is this one single one. Um, the individuals who claim this deduction are high income people in wealthier states. So people, again, in California, New York, here in the district, Oregon, Minnesota. Um, this deduction is claimed by those at the much higher end of the distribution sc uh, scale. So if we eliminate that deduction, um, they will feel less of an impact, meaning that they won't get as much of the benefit um, as from the lower rates because they've lost that large deduction that, that they're claiming. Yeah, I mean, that may be true, uh, but I, I don't have an, you know, who has the option here to, um, to pay whether or not they want to pay their state and local taxes? Because if you do, I like to know where you live. Um, you know, we have to, and you have to actually pay that. You know, I don't have the option. You know, you, you have the option of whether to buy a house or give to charity. And the fact that I rent, the fact that I'm subsidizing people out there that have a mortgage to help the, uh, the government pay for their um, tax, um, I don't feel very happy about that. Um, you know, where's my check from the government for the renting? Um, instead, I'm helping to subsidize someone who's putting equity into something that's theirs. Um, you know, so. Well, and low-income and middle-income folks are subsidizing high-income folks with the deduction the same way. It's 
It's a transfer from okay. low-income and middle-income folks. Which is why I think that the, the state local tax deduction should be the first thing eliminated right after we get rid of the mortgage interest in the charitable uh, contribution deduction. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we just, I just think that's the, the order we do it in. I, I want to take a second and flip the question. What can the federal government or the Ways and Means Committee, Finance Committee, learn from state tax reforms? Uh, the states have been e extremely busy over the last uh, few years in making changes to their tax systems and some pretty substantial reforms. Are there lessons that we can uh, uh, take from those experiences and apply them uh, here at the federal level? So the, the obvious one to me is the example of Kansas. Um, so Kansas in 2012 um, had a number of tax changes in legislative form. They had base broadeners and they had rate changes. And they had some other base changes. Well, a lot of political maneuvering happening in Kansas. In essence, the rate changes happen without any of the base expansions. Um, in particular, one of the rate changes that happened is that if you were a pass-through business, you were an LLC, a sole proprietor, an S corp, et cetera, um, you no longer had no state income tax liability. Um, so if you think about a dentist and a hygienist, the dentist who owns the office is not paying income taxes, but the hygienist who worked for the dentist would still be paying income taxes. Um, Kansas has had a, a great deal of fiscal instability since this has passed. They missed something like 30 out of 35 consecutive months of revenue projections. Um, they've had a number of issues with revenue stability, but also um, a number of people have taken advantage of the pass-through exemption uh, much more than actually was expected. The GOP blueprint has this in essence, the same provision. Now, it doesn't go uh, completely eliminate taxes for the pass-throughs, um, but it does provide them a lower rate, um, a preferential rate. This is talked about in essence of po in political terms of we need to provide assistance to America's main street and small businesses. Uh, one, pass-throughs has no actual um, relation to the size of the business. You could be a trillion-dollar multinational company and be a pass-through, or you can be the dentist that owns a small office in the middle of Topeka, Kansas. Um, but in essence, the other thing that's missed is that uh, we talk about the corporate income tax, and uh, we talk about it being two levels of taxation. You're taxed at the corporate level, and then you're taxed at the shareholder or the, um, the owner level. With a pass-through, you only have one level of tax. So in essence, they actually already have have some sort of tax preference compared to a, a traditional C corporation. Uh, but I think the lesson of Kansas is, is really il illustrative for the federal government, particularly um, in the House plan. It's also in the Trump plan. I, I'll say that as well. Um, that they should give more thought to whether or not providing a preferential rate to pass-throughs is something that, that is a good tax idea. Matt, what have you observed? Uh, extrapolating from the Kansas experience, the, uh, the most obvious lesson to me and, and certainly one that's applicable to the debate right now, is that it's important for policymakers to start with the hard questions. Start with the questions about base broadening, and then proceed to the possibilities of the easy questions. How far do you want to reduce the rate? Mm -hmm. uh, if federal tax reform has stalled or done nothing in the past decade, it's in part because of the relentless willingness of policymakers to focus entirely on the easy question, to start with the need, perceived need to cut corporate tax rates, cut individual tax rates, and then come up with nothing when it's time to pay for these things. Uh, the fact that Kansas abandoned uh, a lot of the good stuff and, and left a lot of the bad stuff really has handicapped them in, in, in the past few years. So yeah, in a nutshell, I'd say focus on base broadening and then evaluate what you can do with rates. I, I just think that the, the, what they could learn, though, is that they're, but they're also playing by two different rules. States are actually trying to balance their budget. I can't mm -hmm. emphasize that enough versus up here. Up here, they say they're going to balance their budget. I think it was 2011 when um, our, Mitch McConnell actually signed on to a uh, balanced budget bill 47, with 47 other co um, senators. I don't remember the last time I heard Mitch McConnell say that we need to balance our budget. Um, and it was a big, it was, when they were in the minority, it was a big issue. Now it just doesn't seem to be that big of an issue anymore, nor in the House. They say revenue neutrality, but when states call me and go, is it what this idea is, um, we need to balance our budget, they actually mean it. They don't want to come back six months later and go, oh, we did this and we're actually $200 million short of where we thought because it's not a rosy projection. Um, federally here, they'll, you know, they'll dynamically score it, and I'm sure that'll be part of this to make it look like it'll be revenue neutral in the long term. And it doesn't really matter whether or not it is because politically, until they actually want to tackle the deficit, 
um, you know, it's going to keep pushing off. And I think that's a concern of is that is the deficit keeps going, are they ever going to get serious about it here, about actually uh, asking the tough questions about, you know, tax reform and for spending priorities. So, you know, if I were to say they can learn, you know, instead of actually pretending to be, uh, you know, looking to address the deficit, if they actually put that upon themselves to do it, I think that would actually put the, that would frame the conversation up here a lot differently. Max, how, how is your task force going to approach this as the, 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 the federal debate moves forward? Have you begun to develop your agenda for that? Sure. So uh, we, we, we started discussing this, uh, you know, uh, the state legislative tax chairs from across the country uh, on the task force. We started this last fall. Uh, and obviously, we're, we were guessing then on what could be in here, and we're still kind of guessing now what it ultimately could be. Um, we had great, um, you know, discussions along with, you know, members of the Tax Foundation, you know, discussing where we are. But they're looking at it, and right now, I mean, states get busy too. They have to make politically difficult decisions uh, that are out there. I mean, a lot of budgetary topics that are going on. So right now, they've kind of taken a pause to this. And I think at the beginning of the sessions, they were really looking at this, what could happen. And then it got to a point, oh, we just can't worry about it. Uh, we have to focus on what our task on hand is. And then when the dust settles, we'll, we'll address this. So there's no doubt that in, in June, we'll have this discussion to look of what they can do preemptively, because our members, as much as anybody, would like to be ready going into their 2018 you know, legislative sessions with a plan on what they, how to address that. It might, might, might be, it's Nicole to talk about uh, you know, putting into a code about a if provision, if this were to happen, or to preemptively have rules or transition um, provisions there so they can jumpstart it and don't have to come back in and do a legislative fix later. So I think that's some way that we're going to look at it. We're, we're kind of looking, even though it's an if or what that's out there, we're trying to kind of be prepared for anything that could happen so that we could not have to wait as long to actually address the changes or difficulties. Well, maybe more broadly, ask how can states be at the table? Um, what's the best way of, of bringing states to the federal table? Uh, I know a lot of industries are, are uh, traipsing through the halls of Congress, meeting with members and talking about issues. And how, how do states go about doing that? Um, I guess we could create a PAC. Put a, put a, put a, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I don't see that happening. You know, hey, we, we joke about, you know, half of Congress are former state legislators, and we joke how long it takes for them to get here to forget where they came from. Uh, I've never seen a member of Congress run for office and at least win and go, you know what the problem is? Washington doesn't have enough control. I, I'm going to be the guy that's going to grow the government and take it a power away from local localities and states. I mean, if anybody knows of anybody, please tweet me, because I would like to know who that is. If they want office, that to see that campaign, but they, you know, they say that, but they get up here, and all of a sudden it becomes Tenth Amendment or states' rights become a matter of convenience. For this issue, states are the best; they're sovereign; they can do this. Oh, but this other one, oh, they don't know what they're talking about. They don't, they don't, they'll figure it out. Oh, this is a tough decision. Oh, we'll just put it on the state level to figure it on that end. And you know, states remember that. Um, you know, it is hard. I mean, you know, there are politics. They, you know, our members are, are elected to all of this well with the same parties that are, you know. Republicans control the states just as much, but um, there is an effort out there on the state level to, you know, do an Article 5 convention of, you know, to require Congress to balance the federal budget. And I can guarantee you that you know, after a few more, I think Tennessee just came on, there are only two or three states short of, you know, around there of actually calling that. That'll get the, call, the attention of Congress that maybe we should actually balance our budget or the states are going to hamstring us. They're actually going to go and amend the Constitution and actually force us to do it. And I think that's it, that, that, le that level's out there as well as, you know, every 10 years, they also get redistricting, you know, so, you know, that could happen. Your district may not be there when you come back uh, if, you, if you go to screw us over. So it is difficult, but we're making those d discussions that are out there, um, you know, starting with, uh, you know, conformity aspect and B, you know, if you push this on the state level and we have to raise taxes or cut programs and we're in the same party, um, it's going to reverberate across the entire ballot. The other thing, Matt kind of mentioned it in passing, but I'd also point is that states should think of this a bit holistically. Um, so things like uh, the Marketplace Fairness Act, the Internet Sales Tax, or things like the Quill decision from the Supreme Court, um, mobile workforce is another area where states care a great deal about what Congress is doing on tax issues. Um, thinking of it holistically, and is there a way to weave all of these issues together? This also perhaps for federal legislators could be a way to get a bit more state interest as well. Um, but can you have these various competing different state federal tax issues um, come together to make it a bit easier for, for everyone to be on board with federal tax reform? Well, I want to thank everybody for uh, joining us this afternoon. And perhaps we can have just one last uh, uh, wrap-up 
uh, from each one of you uh, on kind of what to look for and, and what's, what's your crystal ball tell you? Uh, if I had a crystal ball on whether federal tax reform would happen, I would not be here. Um, but I think particularly for my message is really for state legislators. Um, don't panic. Um, there are things that you can do to go through this process. Um, we, of course, will be available. I'm sure that Matt and Max will also be available to help with any state legislators that have questions through this. But you have a number of tools available to go through um, this process as state, as the federal government does tackle tax reform um, and, and know that there's no reason to panic. I retired my crystal ball in early November. <laughs> uh, uh, but I think. Uh, but I'll, I'll just reiterate. Would you also caution them against panicking? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Matt it. says panic. <laughs> the, uh, no, I, I think the, uh, there's, there is very good news potentially about the way the debate's shaping up this year. Um, really. And, and if I were to try to find a, a positive viewpoint on this, it would be that for the first time in quite a few years, uh, there are policymakers in power who are asking the right questions about the balance between base broadening and, and adjusting the rates. And, you know, it should have been the case for the last 30 years that people are asking, do itemized deductions make sense? Do all the tax breaks we have on the code on the individual and the corporate side make sense? Whatever happens with uh, federal tax reform this year, if the result even deserves that name, it's pretty clear that there will at least be a debate and a more organic debate than we've had in a while over what to do to broaden the base. And it'll be a good thing no matter what the outcome is. Max, will you be handing out Xanax at the next task force meeting? <laughs> uh, you know, I don't think so. I mean, I think the most important uh, tax bill so far this Congress is the uh, American Health Care Act, and it's on the Congress, it's on the floor of the United States House right now. If that, if that dies this afternoon on the House floor, it is going to be turmoil for any big issue at all, much less overhauling the tax code. Um, it also, it's, it doesn't give the, the House a very good opportunity to pivot. I know that uh, the President has said, you know, we're going to vote today, and if it dies, we're just going to forget it and go to tax reform. That's very politically difficult. You're going to go, wait, you guys have been saying this for six and a half years, you're going to repeal this horrible thing, and then after two weeks of trying, you're just going to give up? Um, that's not going to be very palatable. Um, so if it does pass, though, regardless of, I mean, that bill won't become law. I mean, absolutely won't. Uh, I mean, and if anything happens, but they can blame it on the Senate. They can say, due to this, not next week we're going to go into tax reform. We're going to try it. And they, that could actually jumpstart the conversation. So I think that's the most important aspect of it. And then we have to get into text. We have to get into uh, different uh, provisions that are in there and, and how it, and then we can, then we'll have a more substantive debate as we get further in these um, deductions start to get looked at. So you know, going back and forth, I, I don't think we're going to see much of anything before the recess. Um, I give it a less than 10% chance of even going through uh, any, anything this Congress. But uh, we'll see. Um, my crystal ball, I never had one. But if I did, it would be where Matt stored his in November. So um, you know, it's very difficult times to be prognosticating on a lot, a lot of things. But I think we're going to find out the, the first step of that happens this afternoon. Well, thanks to each of you. I want to remind everyone that the Tax Foundation's website has a page dedicated for every state, summarizing all of the data that we have on every state, all your rates um, uh, for different uh, types of taxes, uh, the tax burden in the state, uh, your state's rank on our, our state business tax climate index, uh, which is uh, one of the more effective tools that we've used over the years to uh, help states and guide them through the tax reform process. So there's a wealth of information there for you, uh, and, and I encourage all of you to, to use that. Uh, you can also download uh, our facts and figures on government finance on a web uh, app. So download it onto your phone, and you can have that at, and at your fingertips. Uh, there are uh, thousands of um, uh, legislators out there who have had access to this and use it. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I run into legislators who either have that pocket guide in their in their their coat pocket or they're using it on their phone it's a tremendous uh, tool and resource for for all of you uh, legislators and staff let's uh, thank all of our uh, panelists for a wonderful uh, program and uh, thank you all very much
And uh, do join us on Monday for our third panel uh, on tax reform and families, uh, family tax policy. Thanks again. Can you start with the people? I almost forgot Thank that you. part. That was good. Yeah.